been a while since we've done a graphics card review because fundamentally the market has not been particularly interesting or indeed pleasant to behold. Reaching an idea with the recent release of the RX 6500 XT with a rather disappointing performance and features overall, but the RTX 3050 is possibly different. All Nvidia really had to deliver here was RTX 2060 performance paired with that extra two gigs of frame buffer memory. Well, we definitely get the memory, but the performance isn't quite where it should be. We shall see that it's still capable of good results that you can use ray tracing features and DLSS, but even limited to 1080p testing, you'll find that there are games that can't sustain 60 frames per second, even on optimized settings. Quick word on the card we're looking at here from Gigabyte. It's a gaming OC 8 gigabyte version with a perhaps excessive triple fan design, copper heat pipes, a dense fin stack, and even a spot of RGB lighting. Ports wise, we're looking at two HDMI 2.1 ports and a duo of display ports with power delivered via one 8 pin PCIe input. Now there is no founder's edition or reference board for this one, so you'll likely see a bunch of factory OC models just like this one. Out of the box, it comes with a 45 megahertz core overclock compared to reference spec with a rated boost of 1822 megahertz, but I've routinely seen it exceed 1.9 gigahertz in standard operation. Overclocked, I've noted that it can even hit around 2.14 gigahertz, which is at the upper end of what I've seen Ampere cards comfortably deliver. CUDA cores, 2560 of them, in line with the laptop RTX 3050 Ti, but curiously, this is a cutback version of the RTX 3060 silicon, GA106, as opposed to the smaller GA107 found in the notebook. Memory interface, 128 bits wide for 224 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. In all dimensions then, this is a significant reduction from RTX 3060, so we need to keep expectations in check on the performance profile of the card. And speaking of lower expectations, yeah, let's quickly address the Radeon RX 6500 XT. Will did a text review for us, a link in the video description below, so check that out. We didn't cover it in video, but suffice to say it's not great. Notionally, it's $50 cheaper than 3050 and MSRPs do impact scalped prices. But regardless, the numbers here show that AMD is way off pace. 1660 Super outclasses it whether you're using PCIe Gen 3 or Gen 4, the 6500 XT's preferred interface. Worth pointing out here that our NVIDIA results are with the 10900K CPU, which doesn't support Gen 4, so the AMD results here are actually using the faster 11900K, which does. But regardless, the percentage differentials here aren't great. As our main test system still uses PCIe Gen 3, we're not going to dwell on the 6500 XT much further in this video. So let's look at the core comparisons then. 1080p based, usually ultra level settings or equivalent, with the new 3050 stacked up against RTX 2060, RTX 3060 and the GTX 1660 Super. Now the 1660 Ti is perhaps a more natural comparison point, but the Super was a fair bit cheaper at launch and was only a few points off the performance level of its TI counterpart. So let's dig in. With Borderlands 3, you can get an at-a-glance look at the differentials really. It doesn't change too much across the board. In this case, the 3050 is 10% faster than the 1660 Super, but the 2060 has a 14 point lead. The specs suggested a gulf between 3050 and 3060, and that's what we get. The top end GA106 card, 36% faster. Control. It's a meaty workout for our GPUs for sure at the high setting with no ray tracing, even at 1080p. The 3050 is about 7 to 8% ahead of the 1660 Super, but the 2060 scores a 22 point advantage over 3050. Meanwhile, the 3060 has a frankly gigantic lead over the new offering, delivering 56% of extra performance for a notional 32% increase in MSRP. This is one of the poorer showings for the 3050 in terms of percentage differentials. Assassin's Creed Odyssey has a tradition of closing the gap on differences between GPUs of various strata, especially at 1080p resolution, where the CPU limitations of the title are keenly felt. However, here, 
3060 is still 32% ahead. 1660 Super is nine points worse off than 3050. 2060, nine points better off. Okay. Shadow of the Tomb Raider next. A vanishingly small gap here between 1660 Super and 3050 in the 4% region favoring the new card overall. The 2060 pushes ahead with an 18 percentage point advantage, rising to a big, big 37% lead for the RTX 3060. I mean, I could go on, but I think you get the idea. A quick look at rate facing performance here, where our stock benchmarks are at 1440p, which is a touch unfortunate for lower tier cards like the RTX 3050, but far more so for the RX 6600, which we've chosen to stack up against it. Interestingly, 3050 is pretty close to the 2060 here in Battlefield 5, um, with the two cards sort of battling it out. But the 3060 is way ahead with a 34 point lead. RX 6600 is a more expensive card notionally, but the 3060 still streets ahead. Metro Exodus, not great. The 3060 extends its lead to 44%, while our numbers give the RTX 2060 a 15 percentage point lead. Interestingly, AMD's RT performance gets much closer to the 3050 on this one. Finally, control. Don't expect good numbers from AMD here as raster performance is significantly lower to begin with before factoring in RT. Regardless, the RTX 3050 is 12% to the better overall compared to the 6600, but the RTX 2060 delivers a 20 point lead. With that in mind, the 3060's 51% advantage over 3050 is perhaps expected, but certainly it's not great news for the new RTX offering. So those are the raw numbers, and I'm going to level with you. I was looking for 2060 level performance out of this one because we have three years now of the 2060, essentially setting the baseline for performance in raid faced titles, a set target for developers to aim for at the absolute lowest level. Now the bar has been set even lower, which I can't imagine is particularly helpful. It's all the more frustrating because the one key limitation of the 2060, its six gigs of frame buffer memory has been addressed with the 3050. Also, if we look at how the ampere lines equate to Turing, what you see is the value proposition gradually diminishing the lower down the stack you go. RTX 3080, TI 3090, they're in a class of their own, of course. 3070, similar to 2080 Ti with less RAM. 3060 Ti is on par with 2080 Super, effectively. RTX 3060 then drops to RTX 2070 equivalency, but you do get a lot more memory. And while it may seem logical for the 3050 to match 2060 based on that lineup, we're not seeing that we're clearly significantly beneath that threshold. Still, in a recent video I did on a Razer laptop with a mobile 3070 chip, I suggested that in addition to percentage differentials, we should actually like maybe play some games at console equivalent settings or better, Alex's optimized settings. So I actually spent a couple of days doing just that with the 3050. What you'll find is that with DLSS, not only can you get a really decent 1080p gaming experience, you can do so with ray tracing as well, strategically deployed. Remedy's control, of course, is back and testing it here, even though it didn't do so well in the benchmarks. Raster settings here are equivalent to the consoles. However, I have beefed them up in terms of texture quality, filtering and level of detail. Ray tracing, we retain the key reflections and reflective transparency settings, which were present on Series X and PS5 consoles. DLSS quality mode, effectively allows for a fully locked 1080p60 gameplay experience. Let's look at Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition next, a title that demands a ray tracing capable GPU. And here we're testing the game in the Tiger, the most graphics heavy environment in the entire game. Again, we're getting a perfectly good 1080p60 experience with no frame drops. But yes, this does require strategic settings adjustments. These are effectively on par with the consoles as close as can be delivered on PC with the added benefit of tessellation, a feature not even Series X and PlayStation 5 have. Again, what's making this possible at such a consistent performance level is DLSS quality mode. 
drops occur at the ultra raster settings, but that's perhaps worth the price if you have a G-Sync or FreeSync display, which really delivers big benefits across the board for all GPU users, but especially so between 50 to 60 frames per second uh, on lower end graphics hardware. So some titles are just so super optimal on PC that maybe you don't need DLSS. Doom Eternal, for example, on ultra settings across the board here, uh, with Ultra RT again delivers 1080p at a locked 60 frames per second. It looks stunning and simply runs beautifully. And there's clearly a lot of headroom still left over for boosting settings still further, even if the visual return will be somewhat more limited. Still dynamic resolution scaling, that is an option in this game and it works really well. So yeah, you could ramp up the settings and just turn on DRS. You'd still be locked to 60 and that is indeed worth investigating. Sticking to non-DLSS titles now, how about a look at Microsoft Flight Simulator? I tried out the DX12 beta path for this one, locked resolution to 1080p native, but used full-on ultra settings with draw distance at a locked 150. By and large, this is on par with Series X settings with a couple of minor enhancements. This is a hard ask for a more budget oriented GPU, so I also used the console equivalent 30fps caps. High frame rates aren't especially important for this type of experience, which is all about the eye candy. I'm fairly sure the GPU coped pretty well with this one, with the exception of intrusive stutter that happened mostly at low altitude and often with fast panning of the chase camera. The stutter is a well-known CPU issue. 3050 acquitted itself fairly well here, I'd say. Flight Simulator still looks incredible, and certainly the settings here are significantly higher than Xbox Series S, which the 3050 routinely outperformed in these tests, either in terms of frame rate, resolution, features, or all of them. Other tests revealed that the circa 1660 Ti level raster performance still holds up in optimized settings environments, for the most part. I set Forza Horizon 5 to settings equivalent to the console's performance mode, but again with resolution set to 1080p with a VSync 60 FPS limit. As the initial intro drive kicked in, I was concerned to see some minor frame rate drops. And remember, a Series S is doing this locked to 60, albeit with dynamic resolution scaling. Beyond that though, the intro drive ran without issue, even in the jungle stage, which is pretty demanding on the GPU. To get some further testing from a different area of the game, I used the benchmark, which again showed some minor drops. It's at this point where you're thinking to yourself, well, if we're on the cusp here, I really could have used 2060 level performance. Halo Infinite, without putting too much of a fine point on it, PC performance on this one is not great. Using Alex's optimized settings, due a minor upgrade over console equivalents, the intro missions play out flawlessly at 1080p60, but once you enter the open world, as you're seeing here, it all seems to go rather wrong. While there's the sense that 343 haven't delivered a particularly good PC version, well again I'd say that the extra horsepower is clearly missed here. There is actually pretty decent dynamic resolution scaling support in Halo Infinite. Turning it on does seem to help immensely in producing a much more stable experience. The main issue with it is that it requires you to use the in-game V-Sync and the in-game frame rate limiter, and therein lies the problem. Despite identifying issues with the game's V-Sync uh, implementation months ago, it still drops frames for some bizarre reason. 343 still hasn't fixed it. And yeah, while we're on the subject of that, cutscene jerkiness hasn't been fixed either. Not that either of those things are anything to do with the 3050, of course. Let's wrap it all up then. GTX 1660 Super slash TI class raster performance with RT features, DLSS and all of that good stuff. I mean, it's fine. It's pretty good. You can get pretty good results with it, as I've demonstrated. Eight gigabytes of frame buffer memory. Yes, it's what we need. Better performance than the closest AMD alternative. Absolutely. It's much, much better than the 6500 XT. Plus, it has a fully featured modern media acceleration block that the 6500 XT lacks. These are all good things, but dropping off pace from RTX 3060 and raster performance just comes across as an unnecessary cut, to be honest. It reinforces the view that the lower down the GPU stack you go, 
the less progression there is in gen on gen upgrades in an area of the market where we actually need to see the reverse. I guess there's room here for a 3050 Ti. There's certainly more performance untapped in the GA106 silicon, but I believe we're seeing too much segmentation in the graphics market already. All told then, we have a decent enough product, just a step or two away from being a genuinely good one. And yeah, that's it. That's the video. Like, subscribe, share, ring the notification bell for, well, instant notifications, and do consider the DF supporter program. Exclusive content, exclusive access to the team, spades of early access, downloads in super high quality of everything we do. It's awesome. But that's it from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, assuming that you did. And thanks for watching and indeed supporting Digital Foundry.